Okay. Let me welcome you all to our study group on disability uh, rights and realities. And um, as I had announced last week, Sherry and I were discussing her coming here by Skype because I had met her when she was finishing up as chief resident of the Massachusetts General Hospital uh, at the Spalding uh, uh, Rehabilitation Hospital as the chief resident. And she was moving to Chicago to do a fellowship. But in the course of our conversation, she said, well, I can't be there the day you have your study group, but I'm going to be here the next week. So <laughs> we have her in person instead of by Skype. Yeah, so much so uh, this is uh, Sherry Blawett. I think you have read uh, her remarkable bio, uh, but uh, just to give you some highlights of it, uh, she had a spinal injury when she was 16 months old, and as she progressed through childhood, um, got kind of increasingly uh, irritated at uh, how the physicians she was interacting with would treat her like she was from Mars instead of just a little girl in a wheelchair, uh, or a little girl, period. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, she attributes some of that as her motivation for going into medicine mm -hmm. uh, later. She uh, went to medical school in Stanford uh, University. Uh, she did her residency here at uh, the MGH. She's now doing a for sports medicine uh, residency uh, in Chicago. I mean, fellowship, not a residency. But uh, also along the way, a high school uh, coach said to her, you ought to try competing. Mm -hmm. um, and she became uh, a uh, both a Paralympic and an Olympic athlete. Uh, and she'll tell us a little bit more about that along the way. But Sherry, welcome and thank you thank for coming. You. And we're very happy to have you thank here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is just really fun and uh, a really big honor. So thanks for having me today. And uh, I love that we're a small group. So I have some slides, but clearly this is just the starting point for a conversation. And uh, I'm sure we can learn a lot from each other. So. Uh, I chose today to talk, to focus on, I want to give it a little bit of a caveat. I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about access to sport and exercise for individuals with disabilities, um, kind of as a segue into topics of the right to health, what does it mean to be a healthy person as a person with a disability, um, but of course want to recognize that sport, exercise, physical activity is clearly one piece of the pie when we think about health um, and disability. You know, that's a, a huge topic that could be a year-long course in and of itself. So this is clearly a very niche, a niche area, one that I really enjoy and really have developed within my career. But I certainly recognize that this is one small, small part of the big picture. So um, just to give that a little background. So I want to talk a little bit today about uh, sports and exercise in and of itself. And I've been involved with Paralympic sport, but I, I feel very strongly that, you know, if one is an elite athlete or competing on the world stage, you really of course are just showing one little glimmer or window into into uh, the importance of sports and exercise as a public health topic and uh, the right to being a mobile person and to uh, move around the world freely and to remain healthy in that way and so <laughs> perfect okay so a um, little bit what I'll talk about today so I want to, I think, emphasize, and perhaps this has been touched upon by other speakers, but I really think that disability is something fairly ubiquitous that most people in life will experience, either as an individual or very closely within family members and friends. And um, I think that this concept of able-bodied is, is able-bodied versus disabled to me is kind of, in some ways, an arbitrary distinction because at some point in life, most of us experience either mobility impairment, sensory impairment, for whatever reason. And so disability isn't an us versus them thing, it's a, it's a all of us thing. Um, and I think that's important to remember. I'll talk a little bit about the stereotypes that tend to hold people with disabilities back from maintaining active lifestyles. I'll talk about exercise and sports from this lens of universal design, which is I think a really nice framework when we think about uh, disability advocacy. And then talk a little bit about just best practices and uh, some examples of how we can do that successfully. Um, and of note, and this is, I was just going to say, again, this is one small small piece of, of the pie when we talk about disability and health. Of course, there are many other very, very critical key topics that, that need to be addressed and that people around the world are thinking about and um, continually developing solutions for, you know, things like HIV AIDS, di disparities in diagnosis and treatment, things like access to vaccines, maternal fetal health, clean water, food supply, all these affect disproportionately affect individuals with disabilities. So again, one small, one small um, component of the big picture. So when we think about exercise, these are, the, these are the ACSM, American College of Sports Medicine guidelines for what we all should be doing every week, okay? So 
raise your hand if you get this done. Oops. <laughs> I know, right? So we're all supposed to get 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise, and if you can break that into sessions, like five sessions of 30 minutes, that's ideal. Um, of course, you should ease in. Don't go crazy all at once, but that should be the goal. And then we should train each major muscle group two to three days a week. So if you're doing some weightlifting, you should alternate arms and legs and hit each of those a couple of days a week. We should maintain flexibility and then think about our balance and our agility. So this is kind of a tall order, I think, for anyone. <laughs> and uh, something that we should all strive to, but it's fairly difficult. And I think it's interesting to think about then, so these are the broad speaking recommendations, and these are the recommendations that have been developed in order to maintain a healthy lifestyle as we age as human beings. And so if we want to maintain cardiovascular health, uh, prevent metabolic disease and diabetes, um, just take care of ourselves, that's what we're supposed to aspire to. So then, you know, should these recommendations then apply to people of different types of mobility? Well, you'd think so, but sometimes we don't make it easy to get that accomplished. So should these apply to our grandmothers, the people who are aging, who might be losing mobility along the way um, to some extent? Or how about someone who had a stroke a couple of years ago who might um, have hemiplegia um, or loss of full motor control of one side? Or what about just your average weekend warrior who might have some knee arthritis or some hip arthritis and who, for that reason, um, doesn't quite move uh, as freely as they previously did, although we might not define them as someone with a very traditionally defined quote-unquote disability. And then what about people who do have what we think of as more traditionally defined disabilities, like cerebral palsy, um, being a power chair user, for example, someone like myself, someone who has a visual impairment. So lots of different people, uh, and then one set of recommendations that everyone is supposed to aspire to, so that's kind of a challenge. And then how about me or you? And then, and then you know, again, we think broadly about how we define disability. So this is supposedly per the world report, and um, I think Charlie distributed the summary, kind of the executive summary of that report, but anywhere in the range of 15 to 20% of the global population is now defined as having a disability of some type. And that number is growing, so the, we're aging, of course. Um, as the burden of chronic disease increases, the, sequela of those diseases create more individuals um, who have a traditionally defined disability like amputation, um, things like wounds, things like um, uh, decreased mobility due to poor cardiovascular status, heart failure, things like this. And then of course we always have natural disasters, international conflicts, those are sort of ubiquitous in our world, um, unfortunately, but uh, those will also impact the degree of individuals who have disability. Um, and it's a minority group, certainly, but it's one that, that's different than other minority groups. You know, you could think about uh, uh, gender issues or ethnicity or your religious preference or sexual preference, etc. And people think about themselves as being a part or not a part of a certain minority and disability is one in which anyone can move in and out over the course of life, which is kind of an interesting concept. I want to interrupt you for just a minute to tell a little story because we had the uh, the great pleasure of uh, having one of the Supreme Court justices of South Africa here oh, recently. Okay. And uh, he uh, had been an AMC activist and was mm -hmm. blown up by a car bomb in Mozambique, had gotten his rehab in England, uh, and then uh, Nelson Mandela uh, was uh, freed from jail, and this gentleman felt like he could come back to South Africa, and he told the story of coming back to Johannesburg and going to a uh, party mm -hmm. at someone's house and he looked around the house and everyone was different. He said uh, some people uh, were blind, the hostess was deaf, uh, people didn't have arms or legs, some were in wheelchairs, and they said to him that uh, when he was blown up uh, in the car uh, and they learned he survived, they cheered because they knew he was becoming one of them. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's a very poignant story, the way, the way he told it, but uh, he said he had never felt so much a part of a community as mm -hmm. he did being embraced by that group of people mm -hmm. when he returned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he joined at any time yeah. in terms of... Exactly, you know, exactly. He became a part of the tribe, right. I guess he's saying. <laughs> um, correct. So people certainly experienced 
changes in their mobility status um, over the course of life. And so it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, broad group and something that it's, it's worthwhile, I think, having a good understanding of, like we are all learning about here. So again, the answer is yes, of course. Um, and should all these people have the ability to obtain those exercise guidelines if that's what they want in their life, of course. And um, I think, you know, I would hold that, that there is a way, there's always a way to find opportunities for exercise and mobility for people with different backgrounds. And uh, not only that, I think, of course, if we think about it as being the way in which we're supposed to take care of ourselves as we age, everyone has the right to exercise and we need to find ways to enable people to do that. And um, I think that, of course, in healthcare medical communities like here in Boston, we're certainly very, very well positioned to challenge the stereotypes. I think that oftentimes when one acquires a disability or enters into that minority group, it's automatically assumed that they won't be very active or that your uh, ability to exercise is going to decrease. And I think that's the stereotype that we very much have to work against. And we're stuck. Oh. Let's see. It seems like it's, it's not on the. Yeah. Oh, there we go. You can go to sleep. How do I advance? Yeah. <laughs> you can go. Yeah. Oh. Wait, let me see. Okay. All right. So uh, we got it. An example of this um, would be I actually, you know. Nike has its faults as a, as a company around the world, but they have done a good job of, of thinking about movement and exercise and being active in a very unique way. And, um, and they actually have done quite a bit to support uh, various athletes with disabilities around the country and world as well. And I, I very much like one of the, the paradigms in which they used to think about exercise. And one of their initial, or one of the initial portions of their mission statement was to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. And then there was the asterisk by the word athlete, and they said, if you have a body, you're an athlete. And this was uh, coined by one of their co-founders, Bill Barman. Um, and they've continued on that path. This is a good friend of mine, Sarah Reinertsen, who's a triathlete. And they have, they've manufactured a sole that's meant to go on the bottom of one of these cheetah legs, um, which are frequently used by active amputees to run and compete in, in track and road racing. Um, so as an example of innovation around how we can make this possible for different groups. Um, and then I wanted to, we can do this at the end too, but I wanted to show this commercial. Is it um, easy to? Yeah, I think so. Just look kind of highlight. Oh, I don't know. Uh, I don't think it's embedded. We can show it at the end. Okay. Yeah, because yeah. if you hold the control, the well, yeah. we can show it at the end. We'll come back to it. Let's see. Control. I uh, usually control and then click on it, and it'll turn purple. And let's look at it. Maybe it's not a live link. Yeah. We can paste it into it. Yeah, exactly. We'll watch it later. But it's a commercial that was aired um, around the time of the London Olympics and Paralympics, and it's just very cool and um, really challenges really challenges the stereotype of how we think about disability as being equal to immobility. Can I ask you a question about the yeah. last slide before I forget? Yeah. The thing that you said that they developed yeah. on the bottom. Yeah. So you can have one of those without the bottom of the running sole, like it, it's a special thing for running? It's actually, it's a sole, it's just basically a sole to go on the end of the prosthesis. It like puts the, 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 the high friction surface of the bottom of a shoe on the end of the prosthesis so that if you want to run on different terrains, because okay, so the current cheetah legs, I mean the, the sort of slang for this type of mm -hmm. leg is a cheetah leg, and they're, they're very high end but they're really only made for track surfaces, oh. um, but don't really enable the runner to go on like more sort of off-road type oh, surfaces. Cool. And so it's just meant to expand, expand your ability of where you can use it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, of course. It's that piece that sort of slips on the end. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so what are some of the barriers and why don't we always get to where we want to be on this topic? So these are just some of the things that I brainstormed last night. <laughs> so when we think about um, just basic access to community exercise, most gym facilities, if you think about your YMCA's, YMCA is actually better than many others, but your whatever whatever clubs you think about as being the clear kind of go-tos for where you would obtain um, exercise, especially in a cold weather environment, many of them are completely inaccessible. And um, that's changing slowly but surely, but I would say there's still there's still a large a large uh, quantity that, that are not very uh, open to people with mobility impairment. 
and that's both the actual equipment itself, but also the restroom facilities, even getting in the front door, et cetera. Once you get inside, then the next question is, are there folks there? You know, many people like to work with a trainer to say, well, I'm not sure quite how to get started. I might not have been active before. I'm going to try to gather some expertise about how to, how to do it. Um, and most places would probably not have trained personnel who would be able to say, well, let's think creatively about how to get you involved as someone who might have to do it a little bit differently. I think many people with disabilities fear stigma, and so um, certainly there are some individuals who really don't fear anything and are perfectly happy to bust in and say, hey, you have to work with me no matter what and show me how to do this, and I don't care what you think of me, but there are certainly plenty of people out there who probably would feel a little bit sensitive about the sideways looks that they might get when they're there and or people kind of wondering, well, what are they doing here? Do they belong here? Um, I think there's often a misconception of fragility. So I think often if we say, say I am an a athletic trainer and someone with a disability comes into the gym, I think there's often this fear that, well, if I push them too hard, I might injure them or, um, or maybe we shouldn't uh, think about the same level of, um, the same level of exertion for this individual because they are a person with a disability. In some cases that might be true, but certainly not always. And so um, ultimately it should be up to the person themselves about how strenuous they want to be or how much effort they want to put into it. And frequently I think people aren't challenged to the degree they can be. Um, sometimes, and this, this might be true for some and less so for others, but maybe people are feeling overwhelmed by other things. And so, you know, if it's a challenge to get the basic things done that I need to in a day, do I have time to then go that extra mile and say, well, I'm actually now going to try to get some cardiovascular exercise and be a, be a fit person. And then I think, I think the last one is actually very key, which is, well, I've never seen anybody else do it. How am I going to do it? Should I even, should, well, is it even possible? And um, that's where I think it's very important when we think about these examples of, of things like the Paralympics. Certainly, we don't want to be elitist in our thinking to think that that's the only important component of it because that's for a very small proportion of people who have talent and the resources to get there. But um, if that opens the eyes and opens, uh, opens up our mindset around the topic, then I think it can be very useful. Um, so, and I wanted to challenge any, any others that... that uh, you guys would have in mind because I mean this this list could be six pages long you know but um, I think these are some of the key ones and we can brainstorm and talk about it later too but. Well, I guess I want to add like not just inaccessible facilities but some people living in an inaccessible place where it's hard yeah. to even get out of your house absolutely transportation yeah yeah absolutely yeah and when often uh, in the US and this is probably a very US centric um, strategy, but a lot of people with disabilities take like accessible transit, um, and that's very it's cumbersome. You know, you have to call three days ahead of time to book a car to go to wherever you need to get, and it really takes away your spontaneity to be able to say, "Well, I'm going to squeeze in a quick workout at the end of the day," for example. And they often show up an hour late. Exactly. And you're sitting and waiting and exactly. Saying, I'm too frustrated. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Transportation is a very key issue for sure. Cost is also a big one. That's a pretty complete list. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Those are some of the biggies, I think. So when we think about, I wanted to touch quickly on um, on barriers. And uh, I don't know if anyone else has touched on the, the ICF, Charlie. No. The prior classes. Okay. So this is, this is a, a key framework that's being very much um, pushed to be a paradigm by which we should think about, about barriers and disability. And this is... Um, from the WHO. And what this, what this posits is that uh, when we think about how we define someone disability, someone's disability, that's really only one very small part of what causes functional limitation or decreased participation in society. And so it's, by laying it out in this way via the ICF model, we can see that there are many factors that sort of play into one another and affect one another. So at the top, we have what is actually the definable health condition or quote unquote disease, if we want to call it that. I think that's not the best term, but um, you know, what one's, I guess you could say diagnosis would be. Um, then the second but it, it's, level, it's interesting that, because um, uh, I realize you probably took this out of a chart of ICF that it yeah. begins with disorder. Right. Uh, because clearly, I know some people with disabilities look at their 
their state is natural. Exactly. Uh, and so to begin this international classification with saying that something is a disorder must must be kind of a uh, uh, feel like a put down to some people. To some, I'm sure. And this is just one version that I quick right. stole a picture right. of. And I think a lot of them don't have that parentheses under it. But um, but you're absolutely right. And the I think the the important part to remember too is thankfully this this notes that that's there, but really what we care about is the middle layer, which is then how that affects one's activity and participation. Um, and the bottom layer, which then says, well, just as much as that, if we want to call it disorder, impacts our level of activity, so does our environment and other personal factors within our context. And so um, essentially this is saying that, that you know, with... Uh, one can have one can optimize one component of this tree or this paradigm, but if the other is still very lacking, then we still might have decreased activity and participation, um, sort of overlaying everything else in the middle. Um, and body functions and structure, it's 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 very complex. It's it's again a topic of many lectures in and of itself. But um, if you take the example of uh, say spinal cord injury, that would be the quote unquote health condition. Body functions and structures would say, well, you're you have paraplegia in your lower extremities. The activity limitation or the lack of limitation would be, for that reason, I can't go upstairs, and therefore I am limited in participation because I may not be able to go to work in an inaccessible place. So that's how it's kind of layered one upon the other. And then in the bottom, uh, if we so the environmental factor then may be lack of accessible uh, workplace. But if we change that, then of course, then the activity can also be optimized, and therefore the participation can be optimized. So, uh, just to say that uh, we're now challenged and requested to think about it in this fashion, um, with regards to specifically those contextual factors that might very much augment one's ability to be active and participate. Oh, let me try this again. <laughs> there we go. So this is. Um, and now thinking about what is the evidence about what barriers exist towards physical activity and exercise, I wanted to highlight the work of Jim Rimmer, who is a, um, he's actually, a, I think, a physical therapist by background, but also a PhD, and he's done a great amount of work on this topic of uh, access to exercise as a public health issue in disability. And so I'm going to highlight a few of his papers and just the things that, that we've learned along the way from his work. But he, um, this is one study that looked at 83 adults who are individuals who had had a unilateral stroke at some point, so had hemiplegia. And um, they simply asked, what, what are the things that hold you back from being active if, in fact, you aren't active? And um, I thought this was very interesting. So cost was actually very, very high on the list. And we know that disability and uh, poverty are fairly closely linked and that typically, um, typically individuals with disabilities, if you look at the population, has lower income and is more frequently unemployed. And so, of course, it makes sense then that the cost can be very prohibitive for people, even if we won't, wouldn't otherwise expect it to be for the general population. And it would be pretty safe to assume that probably because we're talking about strokes that these people would be of a retirement age and, and uh, might be on... Could be, um, certainly. Um, you know, uh, Social Security or... Public other. support, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. So, exactly. In people frequently, of course, will retire early after experiencing a stroke. Yep. Um, also very high were transportation, as you mentioned, and uh, simply not knowing where to go. So I want to be active, but I'm not sure which facility or which, um, uh, which outlet for physical activity would be the best for me. Um, unaware of simply how to do it is high up there. And then I think, I think it's really interesting and important to know that not being interested, not having the time, or fearing that it will actually worsen one's disability are actually very pretty low on the list. So it seems to be more of an environmental issue as opposed to a uh, issue of something that's intrinsic to someone or a lack of willingness or desire on behalf of the individual. So I thought it was very important to show that. Can I just do a quick poll here? Yeah. Uh, I'm not a, a regular exerciser in a facility, but in Boston I've exercised in five different facilities, the Y, the university here, mm -hmm. a couple of clubs. I can never recall seeing anyone with a disability mm -hmm. in any place I've exercised. Mm -hmm. Has anybody else? The Y in Quincy has a whole section. They're exceptional. But of course they grow the yeah. pipe and the new building isn't open, so it's closed altogether for about a month, I think. Yeah, yeah. They're a, they're a model of how to do it right. 
Yeah, yeah Wayne Westcott. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. Did a lot of work there. Yeah. Yeah, incredible. They do very good work there. Anyone seen a, a, in a student facility seen anyone with disabilities exercising? Yeah, so I don't know if the signals are that the, you know, what, what on that list is, but I, I haven't seen anybody. In, in yeah, well, I think it's that that list. <laughs> yeah. They even have a program for kids with um, yeah. autism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they've very, made a very conscious effort yeah. to develop that program. And it's, it's seen as a sort of a center of excellence within the YMCA system, yeah. which is great. Um, but I think my perspective, a part of the answer to that question as well, is that frequently, frequently people from the student side especially, considering that, of course, that'll be a younger population and frequently pretty empowered people, often there's just nothing, there's nothing to do at, you could say, quote unquote, mainstream gyms. And so, um, for if to use a classic example of someone who's a wheelchair user, almost all the equipment is uh, meant for lower body exercise. So there's really there's kind of no point in going frequently, um, and there's been a big push for, you know, there are upper upper body cycle machines, for example. That if we could have every every YMCA or every major commercial gym in the country just have one of those, it would actually open up a lot of opportunity for people who who need to use their upper extremities for exercise, but. Um, but that frequently, for students, I know, is a big, a big issue. Uh, what are you going to do when you get there? <laughs> yeah. I had a related question. Do we know if there are disabled people participating in competitive athletics here at Harvard or Paralympic type athletics here at Harvard? Yeah, that's a great question. Not that I know of. I think there, there's a, a tennis club or something, but um, but the uh, NCAA and college sports. Is, uh, is another ball of wax as well. Because if it exists, it's usually at the club sport level, and there's been no integration of uh, disability sport within the NCAA structure, despite a lot of advocacy, and a lot of working groups and boards on paper. <laughs> yeah. Related to your question, what's the population? What's the percentage for the population, for the disability population in, here in Howard? I can't speak to disability at large. My community is the deaf community, and it's less than 10 people across the whole universe. Yeah. yeah. It's small. It's small. Mm -hmm. um, so talking about cost, this is just one, one small example of um, looking, at, looking at that disparity of income and, um, and uh, socioeconomic status as it relates to disability. And this is from 2010. It's a little bit dated, but I just wanted to quick, you know, throw up to show that um, my pointer's working. If we look at simply the unemployment rate, I thought this was actually um, a fairly conservative estimate. But if we look at the unemployment rate uh, in 2009, for persons with a disability, 14.5% versus 9%. I mean, I've heard this number quoted at much higher from various sources. And so just to say, um, if you look at the dis disability community as a whole, people are frequently not working and frequently making less money if they are working. And so cost is always going to be overarching everything as a big issue, fortunately. And employment and disability is a huge area of advocacy and policy, you know, push towards policy change for sure. Um, one of the things listed was not knowing where to go. So this is another study by Rimmer from the American Journal of Public Health. And they did a survey of 35 sort of commercial mainstream fitness facilities um, on six topic areas of the built environment, so just general accessibility, what equipment they had, whether the pool was accessible, what information was available, policies, and how people acted at the gym. So kind of interesting. And um, they found that um, very few play, uh, facilities had accessible locker rooms, so showers, uh, where you're going to go after your workout to then get ready to go back into your daily work or your life. Um, very few had ramps. If they had ramps, very few met um, ADA requirements, and very, very few had power-assisted doors. Less than 10, and this goes to the point familiar, less than 10% had upper arm cardio anything, <laughs> um, giving people uh, options of what to do when they get there. And less than 25% had adequate space between machines. So say you get there, you want to lift some weights, how you actually navigate around the um, gym environment itself. Uh, only half had pool lifts, and I've sh just to show what that is, that's a, a lift that's frequently mounted on the side of the pool that enables somebody with a mobility impairment to actually get in the pool. Um, these are now becoming more available because a couple of years ago, not perhaps at, at commercial mainstream gyms, but a couple of years ago, um, uh, 
uh, all hotels in the U.S. were required, it's very controversial, were required to have one of these. So all your Best Westerns, all your Marriott's, all your anything. If you have a pool, you now have to have a lift. Of course, it was wildly unpopular with the hotel industry. Because, of course, the argument was, well, no one's going to use it. But it's obviously a very backward argument because... If you don't have it, if you don't use it. Exactly. And no one's going to assume you have it, and therefore no one's going to even make the effort of trying, right? Um, less than 25% had information in accessible formats. So what's the cost of membership? What's the schedule? How can you be an active member of this facility? And to their credit, this was, this was um, noted as a, as a positive. They said that at greater than 85% of the facilities, if someone with a disability entered, they would, they would be asked, how can I assist you? Um, please, you tell me what would be the best way to uh, enable you to participate here. Um, instead of people making assumptions or implying what they think would be the case instead of just asking. So also pretty insightful. Um, and then last but not least, one of, the, one of the things that was noted in that first study was people not knowing how to exercise. So this was a quick, a quick study um, with regards to increasing physical activity levels in uh, obese African American women with disabilities from the Journal of Women's Health, again, uh, Rimmer's work. And they looked at um, 33 morbidly obese women who had, um, for this reason, mobility-related disability. And they did a six-month telephone exercise coaching intervention. So for people that might not have the best community mobility, how can we think of other strategies to get you active? And um, it was noted that they, you know, they did a pre-post analysis, and the pre-intervention barriers were very similar to the ones that we had just mentioned a couple of slides ago with regards to uh, cost, not knowing where to go, not knowing how to do it, et cetera. And they found that with this phone intervention, simply checking in with people frequently and giving uh, instructions, I think they checked in once a week to kind of upgrade what they were doing, see how things are going, et cetera, that um, the total exercise time increased dramatically um, and total physical activity time, so simply how much are you up and about throughout the day instead of being sedentary, staying in one place, sitting on the couch in bed, whatever it might be. So this, I think, raises the question, maybe, maybe we should, and again, I, I don't have all the answers at all, Maybe we should be thinking about a multi-pronged approach. We need to make facilities accessible, but then we also need to think about, for those for whom that's not an ideal option, maybe we need to think about how to bring activities to them um, as another part of the solution. And I think, ultimately, multifactorial answers are, are probably the best. So that's the bottom line. We know we have a long way to go, but I think we're certainly making progress, and you know, thankfully we do have some prior uh, background and evidence that shows us what those barrier are, barriers are, and it's certainly not impossible, um, but it can, it can seem that way. And so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about just what we can do to be advocates on this topic. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about my story. <laughs> so um, so a, a, a few snippets here. Uh, the top left picture is me in kindergarten. <laughs> is that you on the right? Yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> with my glass. Um, and then the bottom left picture is when I first got involved in sports in high school. And then the top picture is after winning uh, the Boston Marathon in 2000, I think that was 2004. Wow. So, yeah. Well, and I only bring it up to say that very frequently um, it's all about someone changing the paradigm within our thinking. So when I was growing up, I, I'm from a rural community in Iowa, and I was injured when I was very young. and. Um, as I progressed through elementary school and then junior high and then high school, I had become, I had become, especially through elementary and junior high, active and active in everything that didn't require a lot of mobility. And uh, so things like band and things like student council and all, all of that. And uh, I was very engaged. But interestingly, I think because I had acquired a disability when I was very young, I grew up thinking, and because I had never seen anything differently, no role models who were very active, I grew up automatically assuming that I would be better at things that were not, that didn't involve a lot of mobility. And I specifically sought those out, whether I meant to or not. And I very explicitly remember people approaching me and saying, like, saying things like, oh, Sherry, well, you should go out for the debate team because you'd be good at that because you don't have to be very active for that. So people were implicitly, implicitly promoting that, that stereotype and that self-limitation. Uh, that all changed very quickly when uh, I was in eighth grade and our track coach who, you know, this is a small town high school so the coaches usually coach three different sports and they also teach science and <laughs> that sort of thing. So he's a great, great guy. And um, he had been to the state track meet 
um, in Des Moines, Iowa, the, I think that was in May, the year prior, and he noted that there was a wheelchair racing exhibition event at the meet. And of course, he had never seen this before, had no prior awareness of it, and he came back to school and he said, Sherry, you're never going to believe what I just saw. There's this event at the state track meet. I think you should give it a shot. You should come out for the team. And I totally blew him off because I was like, no way, I don't do that. <laughs> I don't play sports. And I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not the athletic type. I'm just I'm not into it. And, uh, but of course, I never tried. So how can you say that when you never actually uh, gave it a shot, right? And so he, and this is the benefit of being from a small community, I, of course, saw him every day at school for the next, the next year. And every time I saw him, or frequently, he kept bothering me about it, and he had a whole year to work on it until the next season. And by the time the next spring rolled around and track stage was going to start, just almost because I was so, like, getting irritated about it, I said, fine, I'll try. Um, and I think I didn't want to disappoint, too, because he, you know, he's an important person at the high school. And so I went out uh, to the first practice. I was really, really shy and embarrassed about it. And I, I did not have a racing chair at all, nothing like this and um, got a uniform and started just pushing laps in my everyday chair with the team. And of course it was very awkward. <laughs> this was, now I was in ninth grade and you can imagine in ninth grade no one wants, everyone wants to blend into the wallpaper, right? And, um, and uh, but because I had, because I had gone there, I was, I was very afraid to disappoint, so I didn't want to quit either. And so I, I stuck with it and we started to go to the just local regional track meets and they would have, uh, they had two events, and this is very much to the, to the credit of the state of Iowa and the Athletic Association, but at all of the, at the state meet and at all the regional meets, they would have, um, as long as there were participants, they would have a 100 meter and a 400 meter wheelchair event. I was the only one doing them, so I would, I would like line up at the start line, I was racing the clock, and uh, I was still embarrassed because everyone, you know, the gun would go off and everybody would be like, oh, isn't that nice? <laughs> so it wasn't really a race. Um, but at least I was there. And the important part of that was, is I mean, clearly it was the hook. Um, and I still wasn't having any fun, but at least I was doing it. And then when I went to that state meet at the end of the academic year, um, that was really the very important moment because then um, when, I, when I landed there in Des Moines, I met several other high school age girls who were competing in this actual sport of wheelchair racing. And I learned that there was actually a team that practiced in Des Moines. And, uh, you know, my world was very much open suddenly to the fact that this sport existed and there were opportunities there. And honestly, uh, and I became involved mostly because I was so um, interested in becoming friends with these other girls who were wheelchair users because I also didn't have a lot of peers. Um, and that was, that was certainly initial motivation to stay involved. But then once I got more involved, then I learned about these racing chairs and was able to basically get a loaner to try out. And then I learned about the track meets that were in the, sort of that tri-state region. And then I learned how to actually do the sport correctly. And then I suddenly, and then with time realized that, man, actually I can do this and I'm actually pretty good at it. And that honestly it totally changed my life because um, sport very much ended up being like a very central part of who I was. And I realized that once I was active, I liked being active and I felt better and I um, enjoyed it and I enjoyed having that identity. So it all, it, all, it all started with one person changing the paradigm and challenging me to change the paradigm um, to open up this whole world of opportunity. So I think that just goes to show that frequently, frequently it's just as simple, it's as simple as words and saying like, have you ever tried this? Have you ever, uh, have you ever thought of yourself as possibly being someone who's active? I think you can and let's work together to figure it out. Uh, it's a very powerful thing. So, um, if we think about the first step, I think, underlying kind of intervention on this topic and, and how we change that paradigm around how people think about themselves, um, and I think many of you probably have a lot of experience in this, but, um, uh, and again, this might have already been discussed in the, in, the, in the groups, but we think about, within the advocacy community, we very much want to promote a social model of disability versus a medical model of disability. And within the medical model, which is kind of the old school way of thinking, disability is, basically your disability is defined by the illness or the deficit within one's body or within one's, you know, sense, if it's a sensory impairment within vision or hearing or cognition if it's an intellectual impairment. And in that way, when we think about the medical model, we're kind of defining it, the person themselves as being flawed or something's wrong with them. Uh, and our goal then 
as a, as a medical community is to fix it. And if we can't fix it, then we felt like we failed. And we very much want to replace that with a social model of disability, which is a saying that no matter how you are, how you move or sense your environment, the disability is in the environment, not in you. Um, and clearly, if the environment can be adapted, then that is a far more empowering way to think about disability and to think about how to um, empower individuals. Um, so that's sort of underlying everything. And uh, as a quick example of that, <laughs> we think about this symbol that we use as kind of the universal symbol of disability. It's a very sedentary person, right? This guy's just like sitting there waiting for someone to come push him, as opposed to um, thinking about what if we transition to that into even a more mobile appearing person and then maybe even to someone who actually looks like they're having fun uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. There's actually a, a woman in the design school here um, who is working on, she's actually done a great deal of advocacy around changing the symbol, the disability symbol, this ubiquitous global thing that we, yeah, we equate with uh, the marker of disability. Yeah, what a difference in the... I know, right? This guy is just kind of hanging out, waiting for someone to help. <laughs> um, and then something that's, that's also, you know, the medical versus social model is very important in the background of things. And the other, the other thing that I wanted to uh, talk about as being a very empowering concept um, and a way to think about everything to include physical activity and exercise is universal design. Universal design is, is how we look at uh, all of these places, things, information, communication, even policy, to make it from the start so that it's accessible to everyone regardless, regardless of um, how you move or how you sense your environment. Um, and this is very much uh, promoted by one of the, the key leaders in this area is actually here in Boston, uh, the Institute for Human Centered Design, which is over by the garden. It's a fantastic place. I very much recommend um, you just stop in. It's actually, it's an office, but it's sort of a museum <coughs> office in and of itself. You know, the whole place is very, very much on the cutting edge of accessibility <coughs> and making the environment extremely empowering for anyone. And they have a, actually a little shop that has all these really neat gizmos that you utilize universal design concepts. It's a very, very cool place to go. And they have a library, too, if you're interested in learning more or reading more about it. Um, so let's think about universal design and how, uh, from, from all these different paradigms. So uh, we think about it as it's uh, also cost effective for all. And if we think about the elderly, per mothers with baby strollers or fathers, wheelchair users, people who are visually impaired, hearing impaired, um, if you think about our policies, it's sort of a ubiquitous concept. That's a universally designed kitchen is an example of how it can kind of, kind of um, transcend many environments. Oh, and also the last point here. By thinking about universal design and the designing things in that way, it's, it's also very empowering because it takes us out of the realm of we're doing this as an exception for you as instead we're doing it as a way to empower everyone, um, which is, of course, a much better way to think about it. So how would we apply this to physical activity, exercise, and sports? So um, if we think about places, the first paradigm of universal design, so we could build our uh, gyms to have the restroom facilities and the locker rooms actually be accessible. We could put a chair in the shower that people can take in or out, whether you want to use it or not, for individuals who are, might be older and not have great balance. Um, simply putting a little bit of space between machines for wheelchair users and those who use walkers or canes would be very helpful. Um, home video programs could be useful for those who truly have a, quite a bit of mobility impairment, maybe power chair users, those who have a lot of weakness, etc., um, so that people can be active in their home environment. Um, as it applies to things, the second, the second pillar of universal design, um, what if a gym had a spectrum of opportunity? I think, I think that if a gym offered an upper body cardio class and a lower body cardio class, that people would actually take them up on it because a lot of people want to work out their arms, right? Mm -hmm. So why don't we do it? <laughs> Imagine how empowering that would be to a lot of people. Um, and what about if the weight machines had, had removable seats that just swung out so that when you came up to do your, your lap pull downs, you just, you could stay in your chair and you just swung it out and then swung it back. It was on a little hinge. You know, simple things that could really, that could really make a big difference. A couple examples of that. Um, that are sort of in the works. Um, there's this uh, tricep press machine that essentially you could sit in a, if you are someone who's not a wheelchair user, you could just pull a chair up, sit in the chair and do your tricep presses, or you could pull up to it in a chair. Um, on the top right is something called the burn machine. That's a very cool device. It's, it actually has a good amount of weight to it, and it enables you, essentially like a punching bag, um, 
but you hold it, you put your hands around both of those crossbars there and spin it in this way and you could actually take it with you wherever you go and it's a fantastic upper body workout. You could throw it in your suitcase if you wanted to um, and have, have sort of an insta workout wherever you want to, wherever way you want to do it. The bottom is um, a picture of, they call it a crank cycle. It's sort of this new wave of um, the people who have in initially invented spin, spin classes, like when that was first sort of came out as a new trend. And, um, and the way they designed it, that seat can come off and actually they have classes where people, you can stand and crank or you can use the seat and crank or you can move it completely and pull up in your own chair and crank. And um, it's, it's sort of all the rage in, in some places, especially out on the West Coast, which is very cool. Um, if we think about universal design and info and communication, um, what about putting the bulletin boards at a slightly lower height and having it available in large print and braille for people with visual impairment? Um, maybe the gym could have a flyer at the front desk that outlined, like, here are the features about our gym or our facility that make it accessible to you and everyone. Um, of course, internet accessibility is always a big topic and accessibility of, of web pages so that people who use screen readers um, or large print um, uh, programs could actually still utilize the website. Um, what about having someone who uses sign language Maybe it's not practical, financially speaking, to have them there all the time, but maybe you have someone who's on call in case a customer who comes in uh, needs some assistance in that way. And what about just using individuals with various disabilities in your advertising so that when people are looking for a facility, they know, wow, oh, this place must be welcoming to the disability community because they're in the ads. <laughs> and then talking briefly about policy, you know, this happens at every level. And um, from local to international, there are initiatives and uh, you know, we can be a part of this. So at the local level, thinking about the local park service, um, what are we doing to our open spaces to make them open and accommodating for everyone? Um, at the state level, schools and uh, inclusive physical activity is a huge issue. Um, how do we make physical education classes uh, universally designed? Um, that of course then goes to collegiate, collegiate programs as well. At the national level, of course, the ADA has been instrumental in opening up um, our communities in general, and uh, and uh, that of course applies to you know places places of um, that would accommodate physical activity and exercise. Uh, just last year, the Department of Ed put out um, what they call the guidance. Basically, it was a clarification of the Rehab Act um, from the 1970s that said that. By the way, while you're, um, while you're ensuring inclusive, it had to do with education, as you're ensuring inclusive education, um, sports and exercise and, and gym class <laughs> falls within that. And so actually, um, this is going to be a big deal moving forward because now schools are, uh, it's now become more implicit and clear that you actually have to figure it out at your school. Um, to ensure that, that the sports programs are, are open and inclusive, just like your classes are for, uh, from the academic standpoint. And then internationally, I know that you guys have chatted about the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Article 31 actually deals with it's the right to recreation, leisure, and sport. So this is considered an important enough topic to make it in the CRPD, which I think is a sign that, that um, uh, sports exercise being active is certainly a human rights issue, a disability rights issue. Um, from the standpoint of the ADA, interestingly, they are, there are there's the ADA guidelines and checklists, and the the Institute for Human Centered Design here in town is the New England ADA Center as well. So um, they're very helpful in helping uh, or in working with uh, facilities to know a little bit more about what those standards would be. Um, so and they actually uh, do have exercise physical activity based guidelines and checklists, so you can print this out from the internet and say, oh well. I manage a facility, I'm going to build something, how can I make it uh, ADA, you know, fully ADA compliant and fully uh, optimized? And this includes here, there's a, uh, the top one is it looks like a treadmill that they've left some open space next to so that someone has room for a walker um, or other mobility devices. And then the bottom one is the pool lift that we talked about um, earlier for individuals who want to swim or use a pool. So in summary, um, Disability is a ubiquitous life phenomenon, and so is the need to exercise. Um, and I think we can really play a critical role in overcoming these stereotypes that disability equals inactivity, which is not true. Um, and if we look at it from the lens of the social model of disability and universal design, um, then we can, then you know, we all can be really empowered to make an impact. And the, this exercise as medicine concept that's becoming very trendy right now applies to everyone. 
um, now they're they're promoting that doctors write exercise prescriptions uh, for their patients. Like you you write a prescription for a, a blood pressure medicine. Why don't you write a prescription for three minutes of exercise <laughs> five times a week? Um, so of course that applies to everyone, and we shouldn't assume that individuals with disabilities are somehow exempt from that or don't need that as well. And I think the last slide is. Um, Oh, yeah, we can do this or we can just talk. I thought about we could. You know, I um, failed to do something I usually do. I think I was flustered because we uh, got, got here so late. But I'd love for everyone to introduce themselves oh, and tell you about yeah. their uh, interest in, 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 in being here. And then we can have a little discussion. Perfect. Be okay? Perfect. Great. Yeah. So um, I'm Charlie Clements, but we met earlier. And uh, <laughs> as a family physician, I think I encountered a lot of disability issues. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Jennifer Nash. I um, I work here at the Center for Business and Government, and as a result of being in the study group, we've had some conversations about addressing disability rights in our programming. But um, I come here uh, first and foremost as a parent of uh, a young adult with um, on the autism spectrum. Awesome. I'm Carol Dumas. I was invited by a gentleman who's not here tonight. <laughs> I'm a parent advocate for children special education Great. so um, I'm very aware of this the, the gym and the yeah. and field trips for anywhere sure. For sure. anywhere and schools really do have to step up otherwise nobody is allowed to go exactly, exactly. and play yeah. you know accessible play is very important too yeah mm -hmm. absolutely hi I'm Jen I'm, I'm working for uh, a program that raising the, uh, the awareness mm -hmm. for all this that here in China cool. and trying to help providing accessible education, awesome. higher education for them. Very good, very good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Jude. I am uh, formerly an intern here at the House of Human Rights Policy and I uh, just graduated from uh, the law school of uh, Oklahoma, University of Oklahoma. Okay. Awesome. Thanks for coming. <laughs> My name is Fatima. I am from Kassem. I am from Assistant for the National Justice Study Group. But here, I am for my personal interest. Because one of my cousins, I am from Kyrgyzstan originally, mm -hmm. and I am here just four years, I've been here four years. Eight years ago, he went to Russia because of, due to the very bad economic condition in our country, and he went for a job in Russia. Mm -hmm. And he used to work in a, some as a builder somewhere. And six years ago, he fallen down from the building. And he was brought to our country to the family of this, of this condition. And he spent two years just lying on a bed. And just two years ago, he started a little bit more. And he just sleep or four steps in this in his room. He do, he doesn't make any offer to do something. And it's very huge stigma, not for him, but for family. Mm -hmm. He was very forced, very nice, bright, mm -hmm. and he could do anything, but now he's just disabled at home, and he was it's very huge pain for his family, because he has wife, mm -hmm. he has children, and it's very, very poor legal condition for them. So I'm just wondering how they could improve facilities for people like him. And many people, because many uh, Central Asian people go to Russia for a job, but many of them either die there or just come with disabilities. disabilities. Mm -hmm. And our government recently maybe two months ago, maybe three months ago, they came with some of them for disabilities. But I don't know how they will implement this rule because we don't have anything for disabilities. And I told you before, I don't I I didn't see much disability in our country. Oh we don't have that we have them. But they hide in the yeah. behind the wall. We don't have anything for them. Mm -hmm. So I'm just Hello, my name is Deborah, and I'm fascinated by your presentation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in all things of disability law and all the things that are 
as your example, that are going to become requirements. Yeah, cool. I'm Shannon Prince. I'm a PhD JD joint degree student here, and I'm interested in death and disability law and also in the decolonizing the disability rights movement. My name is Karen McCabe. I also work here at the Kennedy School, and I, I'm here. I sort of was brought into the disability world by my sister, who has volunteered with children with autism in China um, for about 20 years, and I've recently gotten involved. So yeah. I'm learning more about autism and disabilities in China, and I don't know that much about this country, so I'm learning yeah. that piece through. Yeah. Well, this is a, um, you know, I had, when we were sitting in the room empty down there, I told her that our study group on Tuesday that usually has about 30 people had three, and our study, <laughs> group, our study group on Wednesday that usually has a couple of dozen people have about six. Mm -hmm. So uh, we don't know what was going on, if it's something in the water or midterms, but uh, <laughs> uh, I'm glad to see that some of you made it today. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Didn't have to change our schedule around. Yeah. And I'd love to see all the very diverse backgrounds and, uh, you know, reasons why people have the background interest in disability, but it's great that that it's um, everything from the spectrum of parents to self-advocates to future lawyers and attorneys, etc. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I have a question regarding to your uh, speak, you know, your presentation. Is, uh, to start with, me personally, it's, it's probably not a very good uh, athlete, I mean, a sports uh, exerciser at all. I mean, I know how important it is, and I know it, it, it is something that I should do, and I think if I really push myself, I might be able to squeeze some time out, <laughs> mm -hmm. but I'm not doing that. <laughs> and I'm temporarily a capable-bodied person, yeah. and <laughs> yet I'm not mentally strong enough to have the persistency in, right. in carrying out right. uh, a sport. Uh, an exercise plan. And I wonder how, well, I mean, sometimes when we are helping the target group of people, mm -hmm. for instance, like me, when I'm helping people who have dyslexia, we know that uh, like, uh, neurologically speaking, they are capable of doing many things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we know that they are more creative, and we know that their capacity. Mm -hmm. but, uh, whether they are, so we know that they can, they are able to do something, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, m m me, myself, sometimes overlooks one factor is there are also people just like us sure. who has, who, who are, well, for me, I'm lazy. Right. <laughs> oh, I'm just lazy. <laughs> and I just couldn't, couldn't carry it out, you know. And it's, uh, and, and, and the, the, they're, they're also human. They, sure. They, they, they may, so how can we, when we, um, how, how are you dealing with the fact that yeah. they are not really pushing themselves? Uh, great question. In that? Yeah, and I think it's a great question. And I think, I mean, ultimately, I think with this, with many, many rights-based issues, people, you empower people to do then what they want, and you empower them to have the opportunity if they so choose to take it, right? And so, <laughs> I, of course, I, of course, would, would advise folks that they should be active and, and exercise and just maintain a basic level of fitness to you know for health but um certainly you can't you can't force people to do anything and so i think the most important thing is that these opportunities are here for people who want to do it um, because the i think the worst situation is that as with this with many opportunities you know if someone does desire something but then there are the barriers are that that's a much larger problem then if there's an opportunity, but if they just simply don't want to take it, and you got, you know, then you need to have pe you know, people need their autonomy as well. Uh, you know, as it relates for certain, it's you know something like dyslexia is frequently a, a fairly invisible disability, right? And I think a lot of people with dyslexia, their learning disabilities, frequently um, you know go about their day-to-day -day lives. And one of the larger challenges is that the disability is invisible, and so people don't necessarily think that any accommodation might be necessary and they themselves have to do a lot of education along the way um, and so uh, and so you know that's another another piece of this too just to put that out there but um, and then there and then there are certain disability types too especially individuals with um, mobility impairment for whom you could say from a health standpoint that exercise is it's important for everybody it's certainly important for those for whom there's a 
neurologic disability or you know difficulty with movement because of a background impairment. Um, and for that reason, like for example, we know that, that individuals with spinal cord injury do have a higher incidence of cardiovascular disease because you're simply not utilizing the large muscle groups of the lower extremity. So for those for those folks, if I if I you know were in a, a clinic visit or simply just a friend on the street, you know, I would certainly say for you it's even more important for your cardiovascular health to exercise. It's extremely important. But there are many people, um, there are many people for whom, no matter what you say, they might not be interested. And then, <laughs> you know, you've done your part as an advocate, and then it's up to them. Thank you. Yeah. That's a great answer I can carry out. To yeah. My work. <laughs> exactly. It's the same for anybody. <laughs> right. Unfortunately, although we have a few more minutes, uh, Sherry has a, a car paint her up at 6 oh. over near our other classroom because that's, that's where I thought we were going to be. So we probably need to allow time to get over there. So I think we'll have to uh, say goodbye. <laughs> but thank you so much for coming. And we hope we see, we'll see you again. Yeah. We'll be delighted to see you again. That'd be great. That'd be great. This was right. really fun. So thank you. Thank you for the audience. Thank you. And your interest.